So we've seen what's almost classical, old-fashioned cosmology, if that's not an oxymoron. The whole idea of trying to find distances and redshifts and use that to measure the, the whole universe. It goes Thanks, all the way Paul. back to Hubble. Old-fashioned. Oh, yes, well. Um, we're now going to talk about, in some sense, the, the weirder, stranger, uh, less common sense type ways of doing it, which have come into their own in the last 20 or 30 years and are now very competitive and possibly even more powerful than some of the old traditional methods. Yeah, and some would say kind of cooler as well. We wouldn't, but... Yeah. Um, and we're going to start off with um, gravitational lensing. We'll get on to microwave background lumps, which are the, the killer method at the moment. But let's start off with gravitational lensing, which is kind of cool as well. This is something we've talked about earlier in the course. The idea is that, in this case, we've got a cluster of galaxies, and its gravity is actually bending the light of background galaxies, so you see these in arc-shaped patterns. Those are galaxies far behind the cluster whose light is being distorted and bent. And we talked about it in the first course as a way of measuring how much dark matter there is in the universe, and we talked about it in the exoplanet course as a way of finding extraterrestrial planets. And this is useful for cosmology, it turns out. It's got three effects, one bad and two good. Now, the bad one, just imagine, let's imagine that you know, the supernova went off in this galaxy here. Well, uh, that would be good because that would be at about a redshift of four and we'd be able to see it. <coughs> but you want to measure uh, how bright it is, the distance scale, and the brightness you measure here is not going to be the real brightness. Yeah, so it turns out that we do need to worry about when we look at distant objects, of whether or not they're magnified, or it turns out more commonly demagnified, because if you have a big clump of galaxies, things get magnified in front of it, but most parts of the universe have a void of galaxies compared to the average. So that means objects are demagnified a little bit. Of course, energy is conserved, so over all the mass there must be a total balance, so if you're going to amplify in some areas, you must de-amplify in others to make up right. for it. Right, so at some level it's not a problem because you just look at the entire universe, but then we have that little pesky problem of selection bias. Because I can see more distant objects when they're brighter than they should be. And that gives me a bigger volume. So I'm going to preferentially find the objects that have been magnified rather than demagnified. And that turns out when you look at really distant objects, a redshift of four, well, it's complete bias because it's the only way we can possibly find them. And we haven't actually found one at that redshift yet but uh, it's a couple percent effect in the nearby universe. So it's not a huge effect right now, but when you get to sort of beyond a redshift of maybe two, it starts becoming a pretty serious uh, thing we need to worry about. And a lot of people are working at improving the accuracy. At the moment, you've got, what, 7% accuracy for supernova distances, so a 2% error is not really a problem. But if we ever manage to get big enough samples, that's for one supernova. If you add yeah. large numbers of supernovae, you're getting errors much smaller, and then it can become serious. A and it is. We don't have that many at the very large distances yet, so it's not yet a, a horrible problem, but it is one we need to worry about. So that's the okay. bad effect. However, there are some good effects as well. Um, one is you can actually use gravitational lensing in a few special cases to get a direct geometrical distance. We talked about this using binaries. We talked about <coughs> using mazes. This is a third way of doing it. And here's the basic idea. What we're looking at now is a foreground galaxy. Yeah, and this is a model of the galaxy. Yep. And you can see how well you can model the system, almost perfectly. So what's happening is you've got a galaxy here, <coughs> and, and in the background, not another galaxy, but a quasar. Yes. And the light from the quasar is being bent around and giving you what's called an Einstein ring. So there's a second image here and a three images over there that are a bit merged together. And right. so you're actually seeing three different images or four different images of the background quasar. And the crucial thing is that the light has to go, let's say here's our galaxy, you're the Earth, and the light can go over the top to reach you or under the bottom. And it will be going slightly different distances. Yep. So each of these images travels a slightly different path length. And from the modeling of the lens, you can actually estimate what those distances are. Now, by itself, that wouldn't be an issue. But let's imagine the quasar is changing in brightness. And quasars do all change in brightness. So here's actually the brightness of the different images here. And you can see they're all jumping around. This is presumably some sort of weather happening in the accretion disk around the giant black hole in the quasar that's causing them to change in brightness. But it doesn't matter what's causing it. What matters is you should see these changes delayed in the different images because the lights had to go different distances to reach us. Yeah, so let's look at this little thing that's in A. It happens just a little bit later in B. It happens a bit later in C and a lot later in D. So that allows you to go through and take this model of the mass, which sort of tells you how much stuff is there. And this time tells you, times the speed of light, the actual physical distance 
of the system. And so that allows you to literally geometrically measure the distance to these objects. Now, this has been a challenge. Uh, there's been a lot of, I would say, work that uh, has gotten a variety of answers. So people have sort of lost confidence in this method. But more recently, the people doing it have been able to do these incredible models, which I have to admit, I, I find breathtaking. But they've also decided to be very, very circumspect. And what they do is <coughs> they change the scale of the model when the people who are trying to make the models, they don't actually get to know what the answer is that they're getting. They have to play around with it. And everything is what we say uh, blinded. So that when they get a value for the Hubble constant, they can't put any of their own biases in the method. And so now they've done that twice, and they're getting answers which uh, are <coughs> uh, respectable in terms of their uncertainty. And I think if they can do that about another 10 or 15 times, uh, they could build up a very interesting uh, measurement of, of distance scale with this method. OK. And another method that's getting a lot of work and publicity at the moment is what's called weak gravitational lensing. If you remember back here, we've got what's called strong lensing, so you've got really big arcs. But let's imagine you don't have a big cluster of galaxies, but just some random bit of the universe in the foreground. Even so, the background galaxies are going to be just a little bit distorted. And so here's a simulation of it. So let's say here's a bunch of background galaxies, and you put a cluster in front you will see that right in the middle you get these big arcs, yeah, but even those further are out, lens, eh? you get these things are a bit lined up. Now in this particular case here, we've assumed they're all spherical to begin with, so any elongation you get here will be purely due to gravitational lensing. In practice, of course, galaxies are elongated all by themselves. They're disks. Are. And so you've got to take the random orientations here and then superimpose a bit more lining up from the gravitational lensing. But in principle, if you get really big samples, and we're talking millions, millions upon millions. So we're really talking a billion for the really big samples, a billion galaxies. And you can build up, it's not just these bits, but out here there's a small signal of what's there. If you just take any one galaxy, yeah. it doesn't tell you much, but if you average yeah. over all these things, you can see maybe they're a bit preferentially aligned in one direction. Right, and you can actually take that alignment and build up a map of the cosmos, of how mass is distributed across the universe, and that turns out depends on how much dark energy there is, for example, in the universe. Yeah, so one thing it does is it gives a check of what we learned from the peculiar motion to check of what the total mass of the universe is. But also you can, in principle, do this in a whole bunch of slices. You can estimate rather roughly how far away a galaxy is by looking at its exact colors, because as it's redshifted, its spectrum will move through the different filters you're observing and cause changes in colors. It's called a photometric redshift. And so you can get a rough estimate of how far away the galaxies are. So you can look at one slab of galaxies, another slab of galaxies, another one further and further away, and look at for each slab at these distortions, and therefore actually get a three-dimensional, almost a tomographic model of the mass, and look at how the number of clusters, the, the density of the clusters, and so on, varies as a function of time. And that, once again, is a very strong constraint on various cosmological models, mainly yeah. on how much mass there is, but also on how long you've had to make it grow. And dark energy tends to change the rate at which things grow, so it also gives you a constraint on dark energy. Yeah, so there, we're right at the beginning of this being able to done, being done successfully. There are some big experiments that have detected it and have been able to do these maps and are beginning to get cosmological constraints. But in the next five to ten years, there are going to be space missions fly that do this for literally most of the sky for billions of objects. And those have the potential to revolutionize how we do cosmological measurements.